Welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to the Monday, March 28th meeting of the Conway Select Board at 6 p.m. the town hall. Um, we'll be followed at 6.30 p.m. with a joint meeting uh, with the Finance Committee and the Joint Cable Advisory Committee. At Rare seven. guests. At 7. At 7. So um, first item, I call the meeting to order. First item on the agenda is approving the minutes of March 21st. Looks good. I move that we approve them. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Those, were, those were good. And it was, it's tough when it, just keeping track of a long conversation. The next item on the agenda is the warrants. We have three warrants tonight. We have accounts payable warrant. $115,547.47. We have a payroll warrant of $112,855.13. And we have a payroll deduction warrant of $28,548.89. These numbers look large this time. This is all, almost all school stuff. So, um, I move to accept the warrant. Second. All in favor? Aye. Warrants are approved. Meetings attended by select board members. Erica? Um, nope. We had a conservation commission meeting, and uh, Saturday we uh, had an FCAT cleanup. I'll call that a meeting anyway. Uh, you know, a bunch of people on the boards of the various towns and the, some of the FCAT people showed up to start trying to clean the place up. Very nice. Very nice. So the, the, the meeting rooms we have there basically are essentially free on the second floor of the Sunderland Town Hall. They're very gracious. We do have to pay, uh, I think we pay a little bit for utilities, a dollar a year. For it. But, uh, but when we moved there, a bunch of stuff got moved from the Deerfield office to the Sunderland office with the plan. We will go through that eventually and see what we need to keep. And it's just been sitting in the attic. <laughs> it's for two or three years now. And Sunderland finally said they want the space, need the space. So to do that. They got plenty of space. It's fine. They're very generous. So. And um, you know, I, I had a meeting with the school administration. There's something going on personnel-wise, and uh, and just keeping tabs on the uh, union agreement that I thought was an agreement still might be an agreement. Oh, we'll see. No. So we voted it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's, it's, Sometimes the uh, the gory details that are left to the lawyers, sometimes they can trip you up. Um, public comments, no unfinished business. So new business. I see Deb Donaldson is on the call because she's first in new business. Um, discussion and vote to accept and sign the TerraCores contract for creating guide maps for trails in Fournier Forest. Are you there, Deb? Yep. Hi, Phil. Hello. Um, this looks this looks amazing. So, congratulations for getting this. Yeah, um, we walked around with Audrey for the starting the process, and she's going to do some more trail walking. So. And then she's going to create a file for us with detailed map of the trails. That, that's great. I mean, I, I do know. So this is Fournier Forest. Is there any possibility of getting them up to the town? The, the... No, she has a pretty limited time period. But, you know, I'm hoping to I'm walking with her and I'm hoping to learn some stuff of how she's doing it. She's using Gaia. So. And honestly, a lot of the trails are already on Gaia. Are you familiar with that app? 
No, I like the name of it though. Yeah. So she, there's, you know, a free app and then there's, you know, a paid one and she has paid and she has other, you know, mapping software that is available to her. So she can add more detail to things. But um, yeah, so I'm hoping, you know, we'll learn a few things along the way too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the only reason is because that besides how useful it would be to comedy residents, because I, I think, I think there's probably more people that go up hiking right now to the town forest in Cricket Hill than, than, yeah. and I could introduce you. I don't, you probably, you may already know her. We could introduce you to a mutual friend of Erica's and mine who last year actually got lost in the town forest. I heard and, about that. Yeah. And required a fire department rescue, which, um, which, you know, lasted till after dark. And it was a lot of people were really upset. So yeah. There's a there's an actual public safety component. I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've directed people up there who've asked me where does this one go to. So yeah, I am yeah. Well aware of that. Yeah. So, but but this is great, and um, thank you for doing it. Um, the only you know we we looked at it, couldn't really find a place for the select board to sign. I know the, the jargon on this is kind of bizarre, but I. I think it's sort of the collaborating organization completing a form is where we find on page bottom of page two. Yep. So. Yeah, here. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's where we sign off. And there will probably be a post building project assessment, which we'll fill out and again, just run it past you. Okay. We're signing it all right now. And um, thank you. So and I guess you can pick it up tomorrow or tonight if you're in a real hurry. Uh, it's cold. I'm not going out. It is cold. Yeah, it is cold. But I'm um, just I just wanted to thank you again just for getting this and it's a it's a good thing. So well done. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome to hang out and watch us sign too. It's okay. Well, we have to sign the warrants. Oh, we have to sign the warrants. All right. March, March 28th. I just wrote a note on it. Okay. Approved with enthusiasm by the Conway Select Board on March 28, 2022. There you go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda ARPA. ARPA. Um, yes. Somebody wants to talk about the owl, the meeting <laughs> owl. Because we don't have an owl. And um, the owl is a camera and microphone setup and uh, for hybrid meetings. Well, it's apparently a convenience for those trying to watch at home. Me never watching at home, always doing it here. I'm pretty oblivious to the need for convenience in this area. It'll make a real difference for like a hearing, you know, where the room is full. Uh, it yes. uses the audio to then move the camera picture to, uh, to look right at and well, zoom in on yeah. the person that's speaking. And I guess part of this request would be for the select board to, to think about whether or not you should continue with hybrid in the future once um, after the July 15th deadline. Uh, I know I would recommend it just because I think it's been a boon for people to be able to join in. Absolutely. On Zoom. It is convenient, but at the same time, we lose something. You lose just lose a little bit of community spirit, lose a little bit of. Well, what if the. One of the it's just not the same. One of the things that Ross had told me when he was um, letting me know about this was that they do put a disclaimer that says all meetings are in person and 
if, you know, if there's something you want to be at the meeting for in person, it's probably best to show up because if something happens to the Zoom meeting, it continues anyway. <laughs> so you, know, you lose out. But it is convenient for people to be able to. I mean, I'm against drive through windows in restaurants too. So <laughs> it's, just, it's the same exact theory. Yeah. It's, it's just not right. I am going to. I think a lot of residents would be upset if we said you, you're only doing in person, no connecting from home anymore. Uh, and I, and I can report back on this again next week. I'm going to go to Waitley and they're going to give me a personal tour of there. And it's the same, the OWL meeting pro that I was looking at for about from between 1,000 and 1,100. So, I, think, I mean, our, our current setup has this, I mean, if you bump the table too much, the thing's going to fall over. Mm -hmm. It also has a vaguely alien kind of look to it. And, um, <laughs> but, but, but if, if if the other if the owl I, I would be interested in how does it sit on the table and is it more secure? It just sits in the middle of the room and yep. swivels its head around at you. Right. And then the other thing is that it is a thousand dollars or so. And of course we did not budget. We, we don't have a budget line item for a thousand dollar owl. We do have a thousand dollars. That's why it was an our request. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. But with the owl, we would not have to be sitting next to each other. We would not all be on the same Zoom screen, so you know it's 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 a different idea in that sense. Uh, you know, I could be sitting over there, and Eric could be sitting over there if we wanted to be six feet apart, which is what Waitley does. They sit they sit they sit six feet apart, and when you speak, the owl moves and looks at you wherever you are, and zooms in on you a bit, so people will be zoomed right in on your countenance, and. Uh, I mean, right, right now, our little tiny Zoom screen that we're all on there is, is, you know, not doesn't really work. And I will say that, like for instance, tonight when we have both the finance and the table, the only way to get them on the camera would be for me to sit here and turn it, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. is not get particularly convenient. <clears throat> well, that's what FCAT used to be here for. That's right, but. And how does can, this affect them? Well, FCAT would would be making well for one thing. This is a recording directly. So the, the, then we just email down to FCAT. Or they download it directly from the Zoom link uh, instead of somebody driving up here and then hand carrying down a recording. It'll save them money if they don't have to have people show up at all of me. But that was a Conway resident. Was doing all she gets paid by FCAT to come here and, yes. and to do that. Short stuff. Megan Sell. Megan, yes. yes. I knew her name was Short Stuff. <laughs> I, I don't know. She's, I think she's got all of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so uh, FCAT still has plenty to do. You know, they, they still record virtually every right. sporting event at Frontier. Yeah. Right. Well, we don't have to decide now, right? Right. But no, that's yeah. why I just yeah. put discussion. So I'll, I'll, favor. Come, I'll come back next week and more specific. So I've seen it used down in Waitley and I like it. But uh, and I would rather we went Zoom the old way and didn't meet in person anymore. If you know, it, <laughs> if it were my, you know, if I were God, but I'm not. And I understand you guys like like in person meetings more than I do. So this to me is a good compromise, all right. but it's better than what we have now with all of us appearing on a tiny little film screen. Oh, good to have for the next great pandemic. <laughs> yeah. okay. Another year or two. Yeah. We'll be prepared. Yeah, we will be. We'll have an owl in a shipping container filled with masks. And I think the only thing that really changed will be that the owl will replace the camera and microphone, which is built in to the camera. No? Oh, microphone's yeah. here? Okay. It will also be much less for me to set up. Well, <laughs> good. That's good too. All right. So the other items are all for the joint meetings. 
And yeah. All right. So we can. How about a brief announcement? Can I do a brief announcement? Oh, and just in time, Ron's here. But so my brief announcement is that everyone in town should know that the road in Northern Conway that goes down to Buckland is closed. They closed it today. Really? And there are detour signs, and the detour signs take you up and around on a road called Bray Road, if you know where that is. It comes down to Agnes. And it is mud season and deeper and probably not really drivable unless you have wow. serious four-wheel drive. I don't think Buckland cares too much. Well, but so I just like I said, I just dropped that road on Friday. Yeah, well, it was in the process. It so had a sign saying road was, closed. Yeah. Some, somebody wrote a sign in cardboard at about the railroad tax facing as you're driving towards Conway that says, Congratulations, you're halfway to the town line, just a little bit longer now, or something. There's like also that. a sign that says famous uh, Shelburne Falls Pothole. <laughs> <laughs> and that's yeah. meaning that road. So, there's I, another sign that says but they, gravel road. I saw that that was last year they got. They got uh, supposedly it's a two million dollar paving job, and that's what they're working on. And but, and it's going to be closed till around July. Wow! So so people are going to need to get used to a different route to get to perhaps even Greenfield if you live in Northern Conway, mm -hmm. or but at least if you go into Buckland. Uh, I don't have a good recommendation except Bardwell Ferry Bridge, yeah. and then coming back on Route Two, we're going all the way up and through Ash, the center of Ashfield. And coming down Route 112, but I would not recommend Gray so. Road. Yeah, I mean you could go through Shelburne Center. Baptist Corner that's Road. Baptist Corner Road up above. Well, that still takes you into Buckland, though. Yeah. That'll, but I thought that would. Baptist yeah. Corner Road from the center. Yeah, I mean that's that's the center of Ashfield, right? Yeah. Right. There's various ways to get to Ashfield. Well, we have we have this map. But the detour <laughs> signs, if you follow them, will take you to Bray Road, which I which I don't recommend. Okay, good to know. And, and you know, all of us who live in Northern Conway who drive that road frequently, yeah, uh, it's it's a real pain to go all the way down to you know the Bartle Ferry Bridge or all the way up to Ashfield. Like Ten years ago, people were talking about doing a class action lawsuit against Buckland for <laughs> the whole the whole. A whole town's worth of ball joints and tie rods. Yes, and so they're, you know, and and they continue to make Ron look good. That's all I can tell. <laughs> and the people in Buckland talk about how good the, the Conway Road is when you reach. Oh, the I Conway know you can tell. Line. It's like. <laughs> um, so. Susan, you're here for a public comment kind of a thing? Yes. All right. So we we can sort of slot you in right now if you. OK, but, um, that'd be great. That'd okay. be great. Thank you. Sure. So um, I wanted to speak to the select board because I saw so Susan Fenton. I live at 901 Roaring Brook Road. Um, and I don't know if any of you have driven down Roaring Brook Road recently, but it has been basically destroyed. It was the most beautiful road in Conway. And the trees have been hacked, not even trimmed. They have been hacked. And if you haven't driven down it, I encourage you to go and see how awful it looks. Um, there are, not only did they cut down beautiful old trees that maybe there were some limbs that needed to come down, but they took limbs off of very healthy trees. They, it was, it's just been awful. And there's nothing that I can do about it now because it's done, right? But I would like to see that the town, before they authorize tree cutting of that to that extent, they can um, consult with an arborist. Because I think what happened was, and I've been guilty of this when I prune my own trees, right? You get out there and you have the saw and you think, oh, I'll just take a little more. Oh, I'll just take a little more. Before you know it, you've taken more than you really intended to. It's possible that that's how that happened, but it's just, awful. It is horrendous. And I also would like to have the, what they did was they chipped the smaller branches, but the bigger pieces of wood, some of them as big as around as my arms are just lying there like a bomb site. with apologies to Ukraine because it's not a bomb site, but 
literally, it is just, it is just horrendous. So um, before the town does anything like this again, and I don't know whether the select board was involved or whether it was just Ron or who was who made the decision to do this. I know Walter said that the branches of the older trees were a hazard and that they needed to come down because they could possibly have landed on the car. And I appreciate that. But the way that they did it was just, it was a beautiful, beautiful road. And it's very, very sad, so. Susan, can I just ask, have you, um, have, have you spoken with uh, the highway, or, or, or Ron Sweet, the, the highway? No, I haven't. I, I don't know. I didn't know that was what I should do. It seemed to me that the town government would be the ones who would be responsible for this. Well, you, you wrote to me and I, and I think you wrote to Bernie and, and I wrote to Ron and wrote to Walter and I thought they wrote you back. Well, Walter said that there were some limbs that needed to come down because the trees were old. And I understand there are 200 year old trees and that some of the limbs that overhung the um, road would have been a hazard, but they, they cut the they cut those trees off at about a six or eight foot height level, just whacked. And I, if you haven't seen it, you should drive down that road. No, because... I, I drove right down there after you called me or wrote me. I forget. But yeah. yeah, but it's just it's 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 a tragedy, okay. really. So yeah, so Ron's here. Just I'm glad you know for something else. The project but... isn't done yet. Everything's coming down that was cut. The uh, we just haven't. We did it what we needed to do while we had the lift. We're waiting for a little better weather to take the rest of it down because of where the wood is going. We can't move it until it dries up a little bit. Are you, uh, are you, Ron, are you planning to cut more branches down? No more branches, just the, the rest of the trees that are- The stumps? Uh, the stumps. Um, the whole purpose of that was over the last five years, I've had so many complaints and so many parts of the tree come down. And part of what we're trying to do to protect our roads is open it up so that the sun dries the road out instead of keeping it wet all the time, because that's a huge issue as far as blacktop or even dirt when the roads don't dry out. It's the state has given all kinds of um information on this needs to be done i don't know if you've noticed but the state has been doing it everywhere um, ever source too well ever sources yeah. well there are no there were no power lines here at all the power right. lines go through the go, the power lines go through the farm and ron the i appreciate to deal with the side of the road there's no power i line. understand and i understand but I, I i drive roaring brook every day several yeah. times a day that section of the road has never had serious problems with it I mean, my section of the road where you guys, and thank you very much for filling those potholes um, today. That was really great. Really appreciate that. But I don't think, and I, I just would like the town to consult with an arborist before you take this kind of action again. It's not gonna help my road, but there are other very scenic roads in town. And anytime you're going to do this kind of extreme cut, and this is extreme cutting. This is not just a couple of trees trimmed. And next time you do this kind of extreme tr um, trimming, I would encourage the town to consult with an arborist before you take this kind of action. That's all. That's all I have to say. So, it, I mean, it breaks my heart. I drive down it every day. We have two hundred year old maples all over town, and right. they're all in tough shape, salt and age. Uh, they were all planted at about the same time. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, think about the barber thing, but at least you were able to speak to Ron at the same time, so you don't have to make an extra phone call. Well, no, that's true. But um, I mean, it's just, it's just, if Phil, have you seen it? Have you driven down there? Honestly, I haven't been there in a couple of weeks. Okay, go take I a went, look. Actually, I, the last time I went, I went the other way just to go yeah. to those. Erica, have you seen it? Erica, have you seen it? Yeah, so I, just, I was going to ask is, is, is it the, the part of Roaring Brook that goes to the grammar school? Across yeah. the Boyden yeah. Barn. Okay, yeah. across from the Boyden Farm. Go take a look and see if that's how you want your town to look in the future. Yeah, so. Okay, thank you for letting me speak. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, they look like there's still cleanup to go, but a lot of and I think it'll look a lot better when it's cleaned up. We had so many issues with trees coming down. I was out there 
you know, every two or three months cleaning up trees. The, the maples that we took down were not in good shape. And I talked to Walter, the tree warden. We gone through everything. I talked to the landowner. The landowner told me that as far as he was concerned, I could take everything back to the stone wall because he knew what was happening. There was very little young growth. Most of it all was um, pretty well old. And, um, and this thing with the tree canopies, that is the worst thing that can be for our roads. And the way money is right now, I mean, anything that we can do to protect our roads for any length of time is gonna be a good thing because you know, last year or the year before, people got upset. Uh, there was a couple of people that were upset about the Waitley Road. The same, I guess, the similar thing to what the Waitley Road was. Mm -hmm. Once the tree canopy grew in and summer came, I think it changed. Wasn't, it wasn't as noticeable. Um, it's always noticeable when you're first there. Um, so it's six thirty. I see. Rick Martin, the superintendent, is there, but we don't have a finance committee yet, right? We have Ellen. 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 Maybe I'll give Roy a call. Next question. Finance committee. This is Rich. Uh, well, let's get Alan to call Roy. Mm -hmm. Well, he did last week and we started without Roy. Yeah, that's true. For two weeks. No. What? No. You were not voting, it's just information. No. All right. Alan, you ready? Silence. Little arrow at the bottom right of the screen means that somebody else saw it, but we can't tell. There was only no speak to tell. Oh, she has to change. Yeah. Who else is on this? Can you go to page two? Alan is non responsive. Alan? It's fine. Oh, there he is. Or maybe just go to page two. No. Okay. I thought, I, but if we're not voting on anything, we don't really need to right? Yeah. Right. Should we start without Roy? Hello, I'm here now. Sorry. Hi, Alan. Hello, hi, hi everyone. Hi, Rihanna. Hi, Alan. Hi. Should we start without Roy? Yeah, we got a pretty busy slate. Probably we should. I'll, I can text Roy and ask him to join us. Great. He's intending to mm -hmm. from that way. All right. In the meantime, you can call your group to order and we can. So while they're doing that, Ron, is there a schedule for when we're going to do uh, a Pine Hill Road? I mean, uh, Dill Hill. Yeah, road? It's this spring. This the next spring. Okay. No, this. Well, we're in spring. Oh, a couple Dill. months. What's Dill Hill? Uh, the, along the it's Shelburne Falls Road, above uh, from New Hall to Daisy Road, and I'm trying to make it so we can go farther. <laughs> Did we pass the money for it? That was the hundred and seventy or whatever it was thousand dollars last year. It was two miles, and Ron shrunk it to one mile. 
No, you shrunk it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't say I shrunk it. I wanted to do my own. I know you did. I know I'm you trying did. to do something so we can get as much out of it as we can. I'd like to get down past Pine Hill if I can. Just because that whole section is just. You know, when we, we were speaking as a group with our state legislator, and we were asked how much it cost the town to pave a mile of road. And we had three different opinions of what it was, I think. Um, right? I, I thought I said it was around 170. And you said 140? Or I forget the I, I, I said like 300. Oh, you said, you, know, you said three something. And, yeah. But I think that was for the two miles. That, that's my memory well, anyway. How much did it cost yeah. us? Well, because of the way I'm doing it. I mean, if, I, if we had money, I'd be doing it different. <laughs> um, I, this is the cheapest way that I can do it. That's one hundred and seven. That's what I said. On the cheap. I mean, if if we had more help, we'd be doing it like we did the other end of way with five inches of top instead of two and a half with chips. Alan, you going to call the meeting to order? Yeah, I call the meeting to order. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Rihanna well done. And, well done. Just Rihanna and I. Good. All right. So um, first on the agenda was the Franklin Tech School, and I see Superintendent Martin and uh, Business Manager Ross Cooper's is here. So you can turn it over to you, gentlemen. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having us tonight. Yeah. Um, we're going to have an opportunity to review where we are in the budget. We'll have an opportunity to review where our enrollment is, how it impacts the town of Conway, and we'll review the assessments, and then we'll take every question that you have afterwards. Uh, to get started, is it possible I could share my screen? Yes. Okay, I just need someone to give me permission to do that. Okay, you should set. Okay. Hi, Roy. All right. So can you see um, the cover of the budget booklet? Yes. yes. All right. So, we'll, so one of the goals uh, for tonight, um, and we'll be brief, we've been doing this at a lot of other towns as well, is this is a new budget booklet format. And we're going to help you navigate through it so that when you receive it electronically, um, you know, you'll receive hard copy as well, but when you receive it electronically, you'll learn how easy it is to navigate to find anything that you're looking for. So we're going to start um, going through here. There's a table of contents. So whenever you see a little fist, when you go down, you just click it and it will take you to that particular section of the budget. So let's start off with the budget face sheet, the sources of funding. And when I go to this, I'm gonna, I can blow that up a little bit just to make it easy. I'll take the top half here and I'll just blow that up a little bit for you. And so the sources of funding is you know, how we receive our funds. The, uh, each of the things highlighted in blue here that you see off to the far left, you could click on and get an explanation for. So for instance, if I click on assessment to towns, it will take me to the explanation. Nice. Um, what is the expectation? For instance, a real quick overview on this is that um, we have an overall increase to our entire budget of 6.7%, but our assessment to the towns is 1.2%. We are giving back a total of $111,658 to our towns. And um, that's because we were zero point, I'll highlight it here, we were zero point Eight seven over um, the five percent E and D cap, and uh, that put us about one hundred eleven thousand dollars over. A lot of that had to do, as explained up here, due to the COVID nineteen. We're a vocational technical school, and when you have half the students in one day and half the students in the next, you are not burning through as much of the expensive stock, steel, wood, and all the supplies and materials. So that left us a little over on our E and D and we are giving the portion above 5% back to the towns. If you needed more explanation, it will take you down here. You'll see E and D credit. You can press that and it will take you to that isolation piece pertaining to that. 
And on the top of each of these- Can pages, I ask you about that, Rick? Yeah. So um, the E&D, the, the, the amount that you're giving back, that's required by law. You have to do that, right? Right, that's correct. Yeah, right. yeah. If we're above by 5%, there's different ways you can do it. You can go to the towns and you can, um, you can have it put into your capital um, budget. You can have it um, reduced into a check or you can just reduce their assessments. So, so, we, I, so because you know the, the reason I ask you about this is um, you know frontier it's this it's the frontier school policy uh, school committee policy that the five percent the, the 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 whole balance of the E and D that that five percent of the budget that half of that every year by policy is returned to the town right the towns. and so I and I probably have asked you this before but I like that policy just as a town we like we like that policy and um has there ever been any thought of franklin tech adopting a policy like that where you give half of the e d back to the towns every year well we actually offset the town assessments every year so we try to do a really and i'll have russ chime in as well but we also um we do a very conservative budget um estimate so that when there is leftover funds in e and d we, you'll see in our budget face sheet, we do offset that budget by more than a half a million dollars every single year. And I'll show you that on the face sheet. So when I go back up here, the table of contents, I'll get to back to sources of funding I meant. And we go down to excess and deficiency number eight, you'll see we're offsetting it by $661,000. So that's how we're giving back on that framework as well. So we do that strategically um, to help minimize the impact of um, the overall assessment. Rush, you can certainly chime in. Yeah, Rick, and uh, good question. But that, that 661,000 is well over 50% of our E&D going back to the towns. Uh, you'll notice back in FY19 and 20, the amounts were in the 200,000, $250,000 range. That was approximately half the E&D back then. So we are probably giving back 75, 80% of the E&D. Yeah, it's about right. Yep. Thanks. Okay, and the next line that you have here is our capital assessment debt service line. And that's just our windows and doors and paving and roofing project that we did a number of years ago. Um, and then you can see what each town's impact is. If you click the next part, 2A, it will take you to the chart where Conway is, and you'll see where Conway's far right-hand side, you'll see it's 6,541 as a part of the overall $205,000. And we're in year six out of a 15 year bond. And so when I go back to the top of sources of funding, it takes me to the, the wonderful chapter 70 aid click list here. And um, as you can see, we've gone up quite a bit over the, the last several years. And primarily that's driven through a couple of variables. One is the Student Opportunity Act, and two is the significant increase in overall enrollment. So with that, with those two major variables, you'll see that when we look at the cherry sheet, which is how we get this information. So if you look at this number, 5,470,850, and then you go to the next section here, click on DOR, the Department of Revenue Cherry Sheet, this is the cherry sheet, and you'll see that same number here where we got that money from, as well as where they list our regional transportation. Now, I just think it's important for all the towns to know how to access that information. So if you scroll to the bottom of this sheet, you can go to FCTS Cherry Sheet Department of Revenue. So it goes right to the website, and I'll let it load for two seconds. So there it is. And then if you wanted to find um, Franklin County Tech or Frontier or whatever the school system is, you just click on the box here where it says all regional schools. You scroll down to Franklin County Tech and then there's Frontier, so you can see that if you ever wanted to. You just go to Franklin County Tech, you press click and then submit. And those same numbers I just showed you, 5470865 is here and the regional transportation reimbursement is right here. 
So that's kind of how we get the, um, that that's how we get that chart to begin with. So I wanted this budget book and Russ did as well to be as transparent as possible. So it allows the casual observer to really dive deep into budgets, not only for our school, but you can learn about other schools as well. Uh, state aid transportation, we just went over that number. It's right here, 765. We're gonna add one school bus, which I know Russ will talk about a little later. Non-member towns, those are the ones not associated with um, Franklin County Tech. Their tuition rates are higher. Um, and we had about 35 students there, which that equates to that number to help offset the assessment. We have a program uh, tuition um, member is a uh, PEP program. That's a self-contained, highly special education program for kids with significant to moderate disabilities. And as you notice, we didn't take any money out of the program this year. And if you ever wanted any explanation, you just go to the far left and you'll see tuition, you click on it. And it just basically says that we're down students. So we have had is, you know, we range up to, you know, 15 or 16 students this past year, we only had nine. So with nine students, we, that just covers our cost and uh, doesn't allow us to put any additional money into the operating budget. So that's where that one comes from right there. And then other revenues, as you see um, the previous year, we were at 25,000 and that a lot of that had to do with surplus equipment. As you uh, know that we're a vocational technical school. So sometimes equipment gets old and then we put it out for auction and we get surplus equipment out of that as well. And uh, then we had the, the excess and deficiency, which we just went over. So that's how we get our funds and that came out to 14,358140. And how we use it, Russ, I'm gonna let you take it over and I'll click the screens. Okay, thank you very much. Um, as Rick has just gone over, our budget in total has increased 6.7%. Um, our enrollment in the last couple of years has increased by 12.5%. So the last few years, we've increased our budget uh, six or seven percent each year. So we're we're kind of keeping pace with our enrollment growth as we go along. Uh, down in the expenditure section are the appropriations, as they are called. The uh, I'll just go through quickly line by line. District leadership and administration that has increased by about four point seven percent. The main driver in that increase is we added a. Uh, a half or three quarters of an administrator to help with the assistant principal's position uh, slash dean of students. So that's the increase there. Instructional services and curriculum, those are the faces in front of the students, those are the teachers. That increased 8.8%. That is, uh, again, additions to our staff to keep up with the growing enrollment. Um, so that's 8.8, .8. student services, which is uh, all the other um, non-classroom type services students get, that's up only three and a half percent. Pupil transportation is a big one that went up, that went to a million 176. That is a little over, a little under 11% increase. And um, as Rick said earlier, we are, uh, budgeting to add a bus to our bus routes for next year. So we've uh, hit a critical mass of students where the buses are, are reaching their capacity, the routes are reaching their capacity, I should say, and we will uh, be looking to add a bus. So that's that increase. And you just, said they, um, yep. just as I can just reiterate, is that when you, again, when you go to the far left, you can click on, it will take you to that explanation that Russ was just talking about. All right, so that just takes you right there. Excellent, and then uh, the only other big increase is um, we, we put some money into insurance for active uh, employees because during COVID or anytime the economy slows down, um, people seem to transfer from the private sector onto the insurance plans of the public sector. So we've uh, put in a cushion of 5.2%. The actual premium rates did not increase this year in the New Hampshire County Insurance Group. So we're happy of that fact. So anything that you see for us for increases in insurances 
is uh, just uh, contingencies or plans on uh, somebody moving on to our plans as we move forward. And the rest uh, of the budget is pretty much uh, stable. Uh, we are moving still, if you look at item number 11, capital stabilization, we're still moving funds into our capital stabilization fund. That is being used to build a uh, steel outbuilding that will house our veterinary science uh, veterinary clinic. So we are uh, through the three years, we moved 850,000 into this capital stabilization and that vet clinic should be um, seeing some action. We should see the steel building up in the next couple of months and then we'll start on the interior of the building with the combination of contractors and students. So, and I'm sure Rick will hit that a little later on, but again, the 14,358, 14,358,000 is a 6.7% increase in total budget. And uh, we were able to only tap our member towns for 1.2% of that uh, total increase. Back to you, Rick. Yeah, can so- I, um, can, can I ask about the, one of those things that you just talked about, the, the, um, the, the cost of administration? So this, this is, whenever I look at your budget, I'm always, um, you know, every year, because fr Frontier is what, 200, 200 more kids. Um, and yet their, their cost of administration is under a half million dollars. And, um, and, and, you know, to hear, to hear you say that you, uh, you know, a new, a new position, a new assistant to the assistant principal or whatever, I don't, I don't know what all, probably, I'm, I'm sure there's to some extent measuring apples and oranges because not everybody tallies these things up the same way, but, um, um, you know, nonetheless, the, 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 the reputation of Franklin Tech has always that that it's been a little bit, uh, from what I've heard, that heavy on the administrative line item. I, well, I, you know, you are correct in that regard, but I would also say we are the only vocational technical school in the entire county. So with that comes an extreme administrative cost oversight that um, is associated with our vocational program. So none of the other comprehensive high schools have to spend $100,000 a year on a vocational director. Um, we also have an extra technology person to oversee all of the software associated with the various machines and software programs that we have in our vocational areas. Um, so there's another cost oversight. The other aspect is that um, Franklin County Tech has a 33% special education student percentage as compared to more than double on average every other regional school district high school. That comes with a cost of an oversight um, for making sure that we are following the legal mandates associated with IEPs and special education. Um, and the position that Russ is referring to is getting back an old position. Many years ago, when our enrollment was on the decline, we eliminated the curriculum director position for the academics. And that was, um, you know, that was hurting us in a lot of different compliance issues ways when the CPR came in and when the New England Association of School Accreditations came in. So we restored half of that position and the other half we put towards the Dean of Students. As you can imagine, um, having the largest high school in the county, um, you know, grades nine through 12, with the type of students, you know, we vary from, you know, college bound students to students that struggle with social emotional behavior at a higher percentage than other school districts. Those are some of the variables, but the big cost is the director of vocational education and the associated cost of running a vocational school, which is why the state gives us a 1.5% um, increase in their chapter 70 differential over the other schools to try to help offset that. Can I ask you a question too? So th there's a lot of numbers. These are always hard, hard, hard to make sense of all the numbers, but you said that your costs have gone up and I think it's the bottom number here about 6%. Yeah, I believe that's right. Yeah. Yep. And, 6.7%. And, 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 yeah. And you said, but you're, you said you, the, the towns, you're passing along an increase of about one and a half percent. Correct. And, and is that because your enrollment is up by 12%? Correct. Correct. So, we're, so we're you're talking about. State aid. Say it again. Sorry. 
We're Any receiving more? more state aid. Uh huh. Oh. Chapter just having based on first student. It, 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 you, you know, it, it's hard for me to know in what times you're talking about the total amount, you're like your whole budget is the whole school, but the per towns, you're talking about a per student cost. So, so if the enrollment of some, I mean, some of those towns went up that, you know, that 12% or something, right? I, like Conway. <laughs> I mean, some towns, their enrollment went up. So those towns, it's, you're not going up by only one and a half percent. No, the overall went up one and a half percent is what he's saying. But the, those of us, those those towns that have a increased enrollment will will get to share in that burden even more, as we are about to find out when we flip to the Conway oh, page. Okay. okay. Um, it's just hard for me to know when you're talking about whole school and when you're talking about per per student or per town. Well, so, as indicated by somebody, I forget who was saying that. You know, as we as we move through our presentation, we do break it up to the impact on Conway. So, but while while we're at the overall the the the, the numbers writ large, the transportation item. So that that's which is every year one of your biggest drivers of costs and everything, and as well as everybody else in the area. But um, you know, we're we're very fortunate in that we're able to opt out of the mega contract that you're all part of and we get to use gripco which is thank thank you know um th thank the lord that we're, we're able to pay such a lower per mile per student mile cost than you are um even though according to gripco the roads that they have to travel are worse than what your bus company has to travel per mile or whatever they have more dirt roads and more potholes whatnot but um uh, you know, is there any thought that the, the, the way that it's currently done with the countywide five every five year mega contract thing is that, that have we officially declared that that doesn't really work very well, that it, something else might work better, or are we still doing that again? Um, the last time we did it as a group of business managers, um, you are correct. Gripco is not interested in taking on um more than frontier so they had a shot at uh of uh, grabbing some more business if they wanted to and they they declined to do that so you're right frontier is very fortunate to have a an extremely low contract and i would i would suggest that you all keep gripco going as best you can for the next uh, 10 to 20 years because when that contract is up uh unless you can find another gem in the in the bushes there somewhere, you're, you're going to see a big increase in transportation. Yeah. The last, I, last, two, last two times we went out to bid as a group, uh, the main reason for that was to try to get economy, economies of scale and get, getting some big competition. Um, companies aren't interested. We received, uh, I think, one other bid other than Gripco. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, and then five years ago, we received a couple of bids, and uh, Kismeskis bus is still the second lowest to Gribco, which is, Kismeskis is another local company. Um, so the national companies are the companies that, that sniff around the Boston area just aren't interested in Western Mass, uh, basically because of the 500 some odd miles that, uh, of roads that they have to travel for Franklin County Tech. I mean, that's, that's a huge area to cover and there are a lot of dirt roads. There are roads we can't get full-size buses up. So we have to get uh, smaller vehicles in those areas that then either be down to a bigger bus or bring the students to the school directly in the small vehicle. So it's, it's a challenge. It definitely is. And Franklin County Tech with its 561 uh, square miles of bus routes is the largest regional in the uh, entire state, geographically speaking. Um, and the number two is uh, 238, which would be the Mohawk School District. So we have towns where a majority of roads, such as Heath, I don't know if you're familiar with that um, town, but Heath and some of those small towns like Corain, a lot of those back roads are you know, all dirt and they're not at all that passable. So we have, you know, we'll continue to always have a large, unfortunately, regional transportation budget until someday the state will actually reimburse us the 100% that they promised when they put this enactment into law about, what, 10, 12 years ago. That's exactly you know? right. Yeah. So that's the, uh, so that's everyone's, 
you know, big concern. Um, if, if I could, are there any more questions on that part before I continue? No. Go ahead. Uh, um, I'm not going to um, bore you to death with all of the details of this budget, only because it makes for great night reading if you can't fall asleep. Uh, you can click it on to your blue in the face. Um, so these are all the definitions of all the stuff that's highlighted in blue. You can, you know, I'm not going to read all that to you, but there is an interesting part here. When you see these instructional services and curriculum, you'll see a long list of numbers. And those numbers correspond with our iVision business management software. And that's just, um, so you'll see like this explains we have an increase of 1.0 in culinary arts because we added the hospitality section. If you click on that line item right here, it will take you to the line item of that particular budget up here in culinary arts salaries. And then you'll see the increase there. So all of those areas are identified with that um, with that area there. So I'll just kind of scroll through. So there's all your definitions and individual line items are explained within that as well. In case um, you know you forget to ask a question, you might be able to find the answer within the within the budget. At least that's our hope. So if I get to the major line item of the budget. It goes right through your typical line items. The things highlighted in blue is where we talk about our discrepancies. So like we talked about the administrative position and you'll see the increase in that position. PPS, um, you'll see sped coordinator, you add those two together and they add the PEP salary and that's really one position. So you start going through all the areas in blue and the other ones are your typical salary line items within the budget. When I get to, and a lot more, when you see our biggest increase, of course, is with instructional services. But I'm gonna show you an interesting grid. If I scroll down here, so we can read through that. I can go back to any line item that you want, but I just wanted to make sure we have a chance to go through some of the other categories um, that we didn't have had a chance to do. So let's talk about enrollment for Franklin County Secondary Schools. Frontier, as you can see here, is the largest seven through 12 school at 604. Franklin County Tech is only nine through 12, but we're 583. The other schools are significantly smaller with um, Ralph C. Maha kind of fluctuating back and forth and all the other schools, either seven or eight through 12, but a nice healthy enrollment for Frontier as well. So that's good to see. Here's how I got the information. And the reason why I wanted to show you this is because any if if I'm on a select board or a finance meeting for a town, I, I want to know and validate where these numbers are coming from. So these are our numbers per grade level. Where did I get that information? You click on the DESC state reports for enrollment. And all you have to do is scroll to the town you're looking for. And there's pre-K, K, 1, 2, all the way up to grade 12 and you scroll down to whatever you're looking for, for whatever town, and it will give you that exact enrollment. So those numbers will correspond to the numbers that you see um, here. So that's how we got our total numbers there. When we look at our enrollment trends for Franklin County Tech in district, you can see a jump by about 20. We are anticipating another jump given that we have about 115 seniors graduating, we'll bring in about 155 or so freshmen. So that's gonna bump our numbers up another 20 or so because there are kids who will leave between now and then and they'll go to other types of places. So, you know, we'll probably be somewhere in the, you know, 580s, you know, maybe 590, maybe 580 at the low end, I'm not sure, but we'll see when we come September. But that gives us an idea um, wh where we have grown a little bit, you'll see the slow uptick of our overall enrollment. And that number, again, if you needed to find out how I got those numbers, you just go to the DESC state reports of enrollment and we'll take you through the individual census and towns. This is the most interesting chart. This is how we plan our budget. So when you look back here in 2015, 16 to the far left, you'll see 662 is a top number. That was the number of available eighth graders within all of um, the six regional school districts within Franklin County. And at that time, we'd had 132 students out of that one, out of that 662 for a percentage of 
19.9%. Then we go to today and we have 625. So that dropped down just a bit. It's a 27% um, take of the total population as we had 167 freshmen. Now, the interesting thing about this data is what's behind the curtain. We are actually taking a much lower percentage of kids now than we did back in 2015, 16. And the reason for that, out of that 132 students, 154 applied, in which 16 didn't even um, get promoted to the eighth grade. So they wouldn't have been eligible, uh, I believe anyway. So we really took who was eligible. And this number, 167, 282 applied. That's a significantly less percentage than what we were pulling from before. But here's the news that's coming to hit everybody that I could find on the website is right now with 625 in our catchment area, that drops to 602, 568, 551, 547, 534. As that begins to drop, so does our enrollment. So you can see there's gonna be that correlation, how we can see in the next five years, our enrollment's not gonna go up. It will probably slowly decline over the next five years. And that's how we budget. So we can budget accordingly. Um, and when it's on the increase, we can budget accordingly. And these enrollment numbers you can find in the state reports here. There's the special education numbers I was referring to. Um, Franklin County Tech's over here at 31.6%, grades 9 through 12. These are all grades 9 through 12 marks here. So you'll get to see where each school district is. So in some school districts, we're three times as high. Other school districts, we're twice as high or we're a little bit higher. But that comes with a lot more resources, obviously. When we look at Conway and its enrollment trend, we see that you ticked up from four to 10. You were on the down uh, slide since um, October, 2017, when you had nine, and then you dropped to six, five, four, and then you got back to kind of in the ballpark to where you've been. And then you're dropping back to nine for next year from what we can assess and how we can, how can we tell that? Well, currently, um, you, we have three ninth graders, two 10th, three 11th, we have nobody graduating. And we have right now we have one applicant from Conway. So if we add that to the eight, we can project out that there will be about nine for next year. That number is not always accurate. Some of the kid, that one kid may not even come. Some kids may transfer. As you see, this number eight is different than the October one count of 10, because we had two students go back to Frontier. And that happens as well from time to time. And so that could continue to happen or they go the other way. So that's a that's always for like every town that kind of fluctuates. So that's the enrollment trend over the next, um, you know, for the 10 year time frame of um, Conway. And Russ, you can take this. So here's our uh, formula that we use through our district agreement and using the state's minimum contribution through their foundation formula. So this is how we come up with our operating assessments for all our member towns. Uh, so you can find Conway on that graph with an average assessment per pupil of 17,621 um, from Franklin County Tech. So that's, that's what you average on your, your payments you blend all of our 19 towns together and the, the town average uh, across the board or is a uh, district average across the board is just over $12,000 per student. So your, your uh, town is one of our wealthier towns uh, in the state's eyes. So that's what's a driving factor. The state on is blind. That. The state is blind <laughs> as a bat. That's a battle I'll let you guys fight with the state. So that's the operating assessment. And Rick, next page. Yep. This we provided just the trend. So this kind of uh, puts dollars and cents to what Rick just did as far as enrollment trends. Uh, so you can see where Conway went the last four years from six, five to four students. Now they're bouncing up to 10 based on this past October one count. And that's what next year's budget is based on is this past October one count for all schools. Um, so you've got an increase in your assessment. Uh, it'll be going up to 176,212. 
and the assessment change was about 145% increase, your enrollment increased by 150%. So it's um, roughly, roughly in line. The state formula didn't screw you up too bad as far as, um, as a jump um, from year to year, at least on that. And next page, Rick. And we've got a couple of charts that Rick and I have presented year after year. And uh, a handful of years ago, the blue section of this chart, which is the town portion of uh, the town funding that goes towards our budget. And a few years back, that blue portion looked like Pac-Man. It was eating up, well, Rick, Rick's got it right there. So Pac-Man was eating up the pie. Uh, we were really relying heavily on uh, town assessments to help us get through our budgets. Um, but since we've gone into the growth mode of uh, students coming to Franklin County Tech, we've moved out of something called hold harmless in the chapter 78, which makes your age stagnate. The state chapter 78 is a per pupil uh, based formula. So if you can start increasing your students, you can start increasing your state aid. So that's why the red portion of the pie is now growing, which is the state's portion of our pie and the town portion is shrinking. So that's about what Rick and I had expected with both the Student Opportunity Act being enacted by the state to give us a little bit more money for um, low income students, special ed students, uh, and a few other things that they tweaked in the chapter 70 formula. And down to the next, and then uh, for a sanity check, yep, go down to that one. For a sanity check, Rick and I want to look at, um, we are a growing school, so we want to see if the, the pie on the expenditure side, is it um, getting misshapen? Is there anything in there that uh, is growing um, disproportionately to other parts of the pie? And when we look back several years to the top pie versus the bottom pie, you'll notice that uh, the proportions are roughly the same. So we, it gives us a quick sanity check in a picture that we're doing okay as far as growing our expenditures and then not Russ, being disproportional. I, yep. Russ, another important factor is that when we look at this chart up here that was 51% of our total budget back in 2017, that's what that number was. Um, when we hired 12 more staff since then and some paraprofessionals, you would expect our instructional services allocation to go way, way up but it actually went down a little bit, even though we hired all those extra people because it was just adjusting for our enrollment, which is when Russ says we need a sanity check to make sure that we're not overspending what the enrollment is coming in at. So we've been pretty stagnant, even though we increased positions from 2017, and this is just 2022. So in that five years, we have 12 new teaching positions and three para positions, and yet um, the instructional service part of our budget actually got a little smaller as far as what we're spending. Okay, Russ, you got this next. So if we go down to, and this is where some of the numbers can get a little skewed, but I'm gonna make a little sense for it for you. So the questions earlier when we were going over the overall budget, um, the, uh, some of the input was absolutely accurate. As you can see, Frontiers per pupil local spending uh, again, all this information is on the DESE websites. So Frontier spends about $16,636 um, per pupil in local funds. And if you look at our average assessment to you, it was 17000 something. So we're a little higher than your regular school, but according to the state formula, we should be about 1.5. Uh, we should be 50% higher. Uh, than the sending schools. So we again, this is a reality check for Rick and I. The other schools that feed into our district, we are uh, roughly at the per pupil cost that a regular uh, high school uh, is at. Actually, this is a blend of high school and grade school. So in actuality, the high school portion for each one of these um, columns would be just a little bit higher because high school students cost a little bit more to educate than than the uh, younger grade school students. So this just uh, is another way of giving us a sanity check on where we are. And we also do this on, on foundation aid. So we look at where is our um, foundation budget compared to the state's foundation budget. So again, nobody spends their uh, at the minimum. Nobody spends at the state fantasy foundation budget. Everyone spends 
over the foundation budget, as you can tell by the little green box, which is the state average. So across all schools in the state, everyone spends at least 13, uh, on average 13% above foundation. So this gives us again a, a look at where we are spending above foundation, which, which the state is, uh, comes up with in their formula and we compare ourselves to the other schools. So again, another sanity check for us to make sure that we're, we're doing okay as far as uh, allocating our costs out to the towns. And then the, the regions that are still in hold harmless, so we are one of the lucky schools. The schools that have a zero hold harmless are, are actually getting increased per pupil state aid through the chapter 70 formula. And the schools that have the bar uh, are still in the hold harmless, which means you're getting basically the same state dollars you got from the previous year as, as you move into this year. The per pupil uh, share from the state is going up because uh, most of the sending schools in our county, the enrollment is dropping. So um, again, we, we've done this chart for our school committee members to, to, to see where we are as far as state aid and being in a growth mode certainly helps uh, when it comes to this chart. And geez, I got a little carried away with charts this year. So again, here's, uh, if you look at each district and you take the local share, the excess local share that uh, the towns are giving each of us districts, and then the green is the excess or hold harmless part of the state share. And uh, you see where each each school district is at. So, and I think and that's, that's it for my charts. That's, yeah, that would do it. Oh, the budget book is new this year. Thank you for that. Right? Yeah, so yeah, we know. actually felt that it was important to um, have a lot more explanation because we realized that in a short presentation, explaining all that and having it for someone to actually read are two different things so do you know when we'll get that i they gave it to us on oh can, can anybody hear me oh, yeah. I've got it. yeah they sent I, it, they sent it like thursday or something i see and i we can anybody hear can anybody hear me yeah. hi, hi roy mm -hmm. yes roy Wait, okay thanks so it's i have a quick question i just want to make sure because it was a, a, a percentage number that went by rather quickly did i hear well, first of all, are, how many other regional tech schools are there in the Commonwealth? Do we? Yeah, there are 29 regionals and 52 vocational technicals. Okay. And did I hear you say we have approximately double the number of special ed um, uh, of, students? Of our county, correct. No, I feel no, that no, part so how does it compare to the other tech schools? That varies. A lot of the tech schools inside of Route 128 are extremely highly competitive with 400 to 800 on the waiting list. And their special <laughs> educations are down at or below what their regional school districts are in the area. Where, um, you know, when you go out to the western part of the state, it tends to be a lot higher. Um, you know, as it pertains to the other member school districts, as far as the special education is concerned. And so you'll have, you know, many of the regionals out here be in that particular ballpark. Okay, I, I just, uh, it, I just wonder about this. That's all. If, if we're failing at uh, the local, you know, the, the non tech, uh, if, if, if folks are using the tech school for its, um, uh, special education component more than anything well, else. Well, it used to be like that. And now we're finding that, you know, it's not so much that we have a higher percentage than we've had in past years with kids that are scoring really high on the MCAS. And we have just the same amount of percentage of kids that struggle in that area. But, you know, there are different ways to measure intelligence. So when we look at the Gardner's intelligence scale, that mechanical intelligence is an intelligence that doesn't always show up in your test scores. So these kids tend to maybe not do as well academically and need supports and may have learning disabilities, but gee, can they take a part of car engine? You know, can they, yes, navigate, you know, of they course. I, I, I'm not questioning that at all. Yeah. I, I'm just, uh, you know, I, it just is surprising. That's all, but maybe yeah. it's not surprising. Um, but I think it's, uh, you're, you're comm it's commendable on, on your part. Um, and I, 
again, it, it, we're talking about kids with eggplants, basically, right? Yes, with, uh, that, that's that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And Roy, for some of us, that mechanical intelligence thing that just never comes. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it, listen, but I, I these days it's, you know, it's, it's everything. I mean, you can't run a machine, you know, uh, you can't run a milling machine without uh, some considerable technical knowledge, actually. So. But th that's not where I w was going with this. I just wondered if there was some a failing on the uh, the other schools that you guys are picking up the the uh, the residue of the of the failing. I I, I mean I there don't... are some school districts that um, that do not are not in alliance with state law as far as access. You know they, it's important for kids to be exposed to vocational technical education, allowing the both schools to come out, present to the kids, even though may, they may have no intention, they're at least aware of different um, vocations and different opportunities. So we used to have no problem having all our school districts, you know, send their kids over to tour our school um, or us going over there to present. Um, there's, there are school districts within our county that allow that. And there are school districts that have stopped that, which then turn into it hasn't impacted our enrollment because it's it's somehow had a reverse effect, but um, it just doesn't allow enough students to know what other options are out there as well. So it does have a mild impact for some kids. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. The only thing I would maybe just a suggestion about your your budget book, like a little one page narrative summary of significant changes year uh, from year to year just you know what were the big drivers how many how many new hires how many retirements that's that sort of thing just a little couple of yeah, paragraphs just I, I i have at the beginning of the budget book it says how to use this book and navigate and it articulates anything highlighted in blue is where you're going to see significant discrepancies and with that you'll find the explanation so i would imagine next year's budget book will have many different um, areas than this budget book. So unfortunately, it just can't be a cut and paste. I'll have to go okay. back to the dungeon and try to do it all over again next year. Right. How many other towns have you presented to thus far this budget? Probably about eight. Eight, all right. Yeah. That include Greenfield and Montague and Orange? Um, Montague, we have Orange next week. We um, generally don't get to do Greenfield until um, a little later in the cycle. Thank you. I have no further questions. And thank, thank you for a very nice presentation. Yeah, I agree. Thanks. I, I have one last question. So the overall budget is up 6.7% is what I calculated. Um, and what what is the uh, increase per uh, Conway's uh, per, pupil, per student increase? Do you have that? Um, Russ, do we have that? I mean, from last year to this year, we would be talking about that's really driven by the state formula. It's not driven by Franklin County tax. So the per right. people cost is driven by the state and that will change every single year. I no. know some years, I mean, two years ago, you were up almost $19,000. Yeah. And, and now this year you're below $18,000. So who knows how they assess uh, the relative wealth, the property taxes and income and all that stuff. And they come up with a formula that they, Feel so it's, right. it's 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 uh, we can't really tell. It's how we come out of the meat grinder, I guess. You would yes, say. And, and, <laughs> and I remember we had a conversation in Conway a few years ago, and Conway was at as high as the state would allow, and you, along with Leiden and a few other towns, is like two or three of you. So they equated Conway to be just as wealthy as Wellesley, Weston, Dover, Sherburn, and some of the most expensive oh, yeah. towns on the planet. So. Um, that's, I don't know how they come up with that. So because uh, we're a small enough town that just one family, two families yeah. with, the, right. with significant wealth. Just that, that the whole thing. Annual yeah. income of over seven figures. Yeah. I, I tell people, rich people moving to our town makes everybody's taxes go up. Yeah. Nobody believes it, but this is, this is what you're talking about. So comparative year over year, uh, your assessment went down about 300 bucks. So it was 17.9 per student roughly last year, and it's 17.6 per student roughly this year. Okay. All right. Anything else, or can we let them go? Yeah. I'm good. I think uh, 
but thank you for the presentation and thank you. Look, look forward to seeing one of you dodging questions at town at town meeting. <laughs> thank you, folks. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Great. Next item on the Joint Finance Committee uh, extravaganza is Ron Sweet and his capital request. All right, I'll, I did submit two, but read the three. One that I actually did. Yeah, Ron Sweet asking for more toys. Take off what cost this time of meeting. What'd you say? What's going on? Is that what he was saying? He couldn't hear I don't know, but you don't have the microphone. So. We couldn't hear him, so whatever he was complaining about not hearing them. <laughs> Can you hear me now? What? Can you hear me now? <laughs> this is... <laughs> not sure what you said. Could you not hear me? Be here. Okay. So I had requested two. I had two requests. I um, pulled one back, and then the other one I actually increased a little bit. It was I had originally asked for one hundred twenty-five thousand for the over-the-fence mower, and I've increased it to one hundred and forty because of the way everything's going right now, and. I'm not even sure at this point, we can't get a firm price. Um, nobody's willing to give any firm prices. Nobody's willing to tell you when you can get one. It might take a couple of years to get. Um, and you're pulling back the grader. I I'm pulling back the grader um, at this point. Um, Veronique was saying that there was some, um, the money we don't have in the stabilization in, it's not a good year. To... Well, I'm not. And I'm not even sure what now with the 300,000, if that would cover a new grader. I mean, yeah. it, things are really bad out there right now when it comes to buying things. Um, so at this point, we're getting, we'll make the grader keep going, doing what it's been doing. And hopefully we don't have any major repairs with it, but um, the over the fence more, um, I'd like to move ahead with that if we could. So, I mean, the part of that is, you know, that we've, we're sort of set up as a town. Like every year, we put one hundred and fifty thousand into the capital stabilization. That sort of, so every year the balance of that is like two hundred something. Mm -hmm. So, that we're not really set up to do four hundred thousand dollar annual capital request. We're kind of set up to do. Yeah, but you, well, you know, we also did have a um, a plan that kind of also got thrown off too because things didn't get moved forward when they should have and what's going to happen now and i'm not sure if one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year is, is going to cover what's coming down the road i mean we're past the point now where the equipment is getting older the plan was to trade it while it had trading value and we're getting past that point and now you're going to be looking at full purchase price with no trade-in values. And you're gonna, the town's gonna be in pretty rough shape when it comes time to start replacing the bigger equipment. The greater, um, it's one of them. It got asked to be replaced four or five years ago um, when it needed a transmission repair. Um, it got put off because money, but to grade it back then was a lot cheaper than now. Um, and nothing's going down price-wise. I mean, we're going the other way so fast right now that um, I think the town's going to be in big trouble here five, six years down the road. Yeah, we, don't, we don't really have for this year, but I mean, there might be something to that to try to bump up that amount we put into capital stabilization. Because once we do that, we're never going to have 
right. We're going to be in this situation right. here. So the over the fence mower, did we used to hire that out? No, that was originally the mower that we have now came from Eversource or one belt. It was part of their program for mowing back um, that the town did with five other towns or four other towns. Um, but yes, we do. We now do all the roadside mowing. Yeah. Um, that used to get hired out. But before that tractor and the Kubota tractor, we now do it all in house. Well, I appreciate you thinking you can get by with only 140. So, so this is replacing a 22 year, no, no, no 14, 14, 15 14 year, year old tractor. Yeah. Oh, okay. and, 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 and a 2008 tractor. Right. How many engine hours does it have on it, Ron? Any idea? <laughs> yeah, um, our favorite question. I'll leave it to around, uh, I should have looked. I think it's, uh, I'm, I'm not positive. For some reason, I think it's around 7,000 hours. But that, that sounds a little high. That is the one question I will bet money that we hear at town meeting. Well, yeah, well, that's the way it works. So. Yeah. Thank you. The whole thing with um, hours for, uh, with town versus private is private makes money with their machines. And it's a lot easier for them to repair because they're making money with their machines. With the town, we're strictly money at losing, the will of the town. Money losing operation. Yes. Um, so sometimes it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to bring it to the end of its life because of the money that's spent that people don't realize that comes out of my operating budget for these things. So, so you're saying, Ron, that we might have to allocate more for repairs of equipment and a regular operating maintenance. We're, we're under maintaining our equipment. I mean, that could be something we can incorporate into the budget, operating budget. Well, I've been able to hold my budget to what I request each year or whatever is given to me each year. Um, but what I'm saying is that we could help my budget and I could spend monies on other, you know, repairs of roads and stuff instead of fixing equipment. Um, if we didn't wait so long to upgrade. That's what I was trying to do with the five year plan was so that I was taking away a lot of the maintenance and repairs. Because as everybody knows, the longer you hold on to something, the lot more, the bigger the repairs are and maintenance and all that stuff. Understood, thank you. Brianna and Roy, have you any further questions? No, in this moment. <clears throat> thank you. Well, I think that um, there's, um, I, I, what stands out to me here is, um, you know, are we, are we banking enough in the stabilization funds given the inflationary effect on prices? Are we looking at a 10% increase across the board? Is it gonna stay like this? Is it, uh, or are we gonna be looking? We're certainly not seeing it, gonna see a decrease because everything has more technical stuff in it. Um, that's for sure. So, you know, maybe that 150 number is not enough. That's yeah. It's just one of those things that every year makes you just feel poor. Something to think about. I mean, <laughs> we, in a way, we never have enough. No, it, it would be nice. <laughs> We're not limited to that, though, boy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it'd I be mean, nice. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, huh? we we put that in it so we'll have some money to spend, but right. we can spend more than that if we need. To. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's um, it's unwieldy. Probably bigger towns do essentially what Ron was saying that the public, the private sector does. They bill it out. So I mean, if you if you're running a hundred hours on a machine, you kind of know how much to set aside for 
you know, for repair and maintenance or and depreciation or whatever. You know, but it takes a big town, I think, to, to be able to put the resources to, to all that um, accounting, if you will. Bigger towns, they never have to stand up in public and answer questions like, how many hours does that machine have on it? <laughs> for real. Well, they, they got to answer to somebody somewhere, to, you know, right? I hope they do. <laughs> okay. I'm all no. set. So, so are we ready? They, I mean, that, are we going to vote that, on this? No, we don't We're vote on this yet. Okay. okay. The, but the, the 140,000, that estimate was, uh, that was like, more, that was the best estimate you could get or the best. Quote. Yeah, best for the moment. I mean, I mean 125 is based on what you told us a couple of years ago. Right. You know, and things were fairly stable there until a year ago. It's kind of really gone downhill as far as trying to plan anything. The, the trade-in and the form the, the, is just a question mark. The, the, the 2008 has zero, that you know, doesn't have a trade-in. Oh, I don't, I keep, nobody's willing to give me a, a trade-in value. So I'm just, uh, that's why I increased it because I wanted to make sure so the town may end up with some money back, you know, or we want, may not spend the whole 140. I just want to make sure that when we, because there's no sense in going through the process and then end up not, you know, being $20,000 short. And not, because I did that once with the Kubota tractor that we had to go back a year later and ask for more money. Things didn't work out the way we was hoping. All right. All right. So could we put off the other three capital requests? I mean, what are the three? The school? Well, Bob Baker has one, and the school, and it was just going to be a review. And we, we've done all of them. So it's fine. great. We haven't done schools. The walking tour. Can oh, we yeah. do it next? Can we, can we do it next week? So we can move on the I mean, it's seven thirty, yeah. and 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 yeah, we're really yeah, yeah. hoping to to get the cable done. So. Yeah. So right, Alan? Yeah. So next week we'll vote on the uh, Ron, uh, Ken, uh, Ken Rometz request and then the uh, allocation for the Frontier Regional School for the walk in cooler refrigerator freezer. All right. And then also the um, allocating $100,000 to put into a, step, a stabilization fund to replace our fire pumper truck, right? That, that Chief yeah. Baker. Has. All right. Okay. All right. Gordon Rian, are you around next Monday? Is that, can you attend? I'm around. Yeah, Thank next you. Monday. Yes, it's okay. Right. I will be here. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll see you next week. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Well. Right. So can we uh, up the cable advisory committee meeting? Call that to order. And, and our, our Bill Solomon, our lawyer, is on the phone. And, yes. And John, uh, Jonathan Barkin was was on there a little while ago. I don't see him on there right now. He, he, he may have had to go up on the clock or something. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, he did leave a message and give up a statement. Okay. Do you want me to read it? Sure. Okay. So he said, this is my statement of affirmation that the Comcast contract is ready to go. The level of detail we reviewed was frankly surprising, and I'm relieved that Comcast is signing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, Bill, do you want to go over what these last few changes were? Or do you want to just take questions? Well, yeah, they, you know, they, I know. They, they were just a, a minor word uh, correction. So, um, I, I can I, for the board. I can. I, I'll, I'll, I will mention those. Can uh, you put Bill uh, share screen? Oh, sure. Sorry. No, he's, he, you're gonna. You can share your screen, Bill. Sure. Um, let's see if I have the. Uh, okay.
Okay. Uh, the, 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 the final changes were, you know, you proved these a million times. I can't, we've worked with this for five or six years. I proved it a thousand times. Uh, but I, I always do one very last one where I sit in a chair and do nothing but um, proof. Let me just close this door. So, Bill, I noticed that spelling mistake in the index is still in there. Oh well, you will sign it, and I'll correct that. What, okay. what can you tell me what it what it is? All right. So, on page nine, the um, so you you don't have the whole thing, but I have. Can you see page nine there? Page nine, no big deal. The word peg access designee, sometimes it's referred to as access designee. So I just added or access designee, very minor. And then on page 29, there is a reference here to Six, it had said section six one D below because we added a section here in HD high definition. What had been C became D, so I changed six point one C to six point one D, very minor. And the uh, page thirty six, uh, peg access channel access and channel. It's a defined term. I made the A a capital and a C on the channel a capital. Very minor. So those are minuscule. And Bob, did you say there was a table of contents issue? Yeah. Uh, you know, cat, it, when somebody edited and changed all the oh, city, oh, the towns, city one. The okay. capacity became Kappa Town. Okay. Well, and that's where is that? I can find it, but uh, uh, it's in the index on. I'll find here. If you search for capital, yeah, here three point nine. So, yeah, uh, yeah three point nine. Uh, we'll change that. So, if you'd like, I can go through. Let me end this. I can put the summary on. Yeah. How often do we renegotiate this every? Well, it's supposed to be every ten years, but so. this has been going on a couple of years extra, okay. uh, mostly because of the pandemic and 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 uh, and and we're trying to add in this year or to this franchise agreement, some changes we want Comcast to make for us here in Conway to connect this building to the town office with fiber and to allow us to run live programming from here to get it down to the server in Deerfield. It's like the holy grail now for how many years? Yeah, and it, and it took Comcast years till they understood what we wanted to do. And I, I just can't tell you how hard it was for us to get Comcast to understand that. Okay, uh, let me let me get the summary up. I'm sorry, one sec. Isn't that complicated? Yeah. Didn't they keep losing engineers? And then yeah, the, yeah, the engineers kept retiring. Yeah, retiring right? yeah. a new guy. Yeah, and it was a bunch of noise back and forth on this change and stuff because a different town want to make their own give to you know the lawyer speak. And, so. Okay, so. Bill may talk about. How okay. Yeah. Everyone see the summary there? Yeah. Okay. So the summary is the it's a 10 year license beginning April 1st, 2022. As of uh, December 31st, 2020, there were 501 subscribers. It, it, we just got the number at the end of 2021. It was a few less subscribers, but not materially less. The PEG access annual support, uh, it's a percentage of gross revenue. It's currently 4% of gross revenues. It's increasing to 4.8% of gross revenues. The maximum allowed under federal law, the Cable Act is five, but when you get much above 4.8, you really don't get it anyway because it gets deducted due to a license fee that, that, that this state law requires 50 cents a year to the town per subscriber, 
and 80 cents to the Commonwealth. That's a dollar 30 for a subscriber. And there's a new FCC order, a little bit of whole cloth that in theory could allow some other deduction or other things count toward the franchise fee. So the advantage of something around 4.8 is we would, if we made it higher, we wouldn't see it anyway. And yet uh, it'd be something that the cable company could bill for. So 4.8 is a good number. Capital support, $11,050 paid in 10 installments. That number is materially less than it could have been because in exchange for the lower number or balancing the uh, significant portion of the equipment that's needed to cable cast from your town hall to your town office, from your town office, instead of to the Comcast head end in Deerfield, but instead to the Peg Access Studio at front, uh, Frontier Community Television in the Deerfield Town Hall, that a significant amount of that equipment is purchased by Comcast. Um, and we have a list here of the um, licensees shall provide and install. It has a list of fiber transmitters and fiber from the town hall to the town office, fiber mucks in the town office, different equipment at the town, town hall, town office, and Deerfield studio that's being uh, paid for and installed by Comcast. And uh, in order to get the benefit of that, uh, so, some of the equipment is maintained by Comcast, some by the town. Uh, we uh, we balance that with a capital dollar number. Peg so access. So, Bill, so, so this number was up about 32,000, if you remember. A couple of years ago, in that's the, right. The agreement, and and but we were going to pay for all of the equipment, and right at the last minute they balked at that. But then they agreed if we lowered this to to eleven thousand a year, and they would pay for all the equipment, and and it comes out to a good deal for us. And uh, right, and and uh, and then any equipment that they buy which has to be new, they'll provide the warranties for of that equipment that we'll maintain and other equipment they maintain. And those distinctions are set out in the cable, the cable license. Uh, there'll continue to be three PEG public education government access channels. The one from Conway, uh, from the town office and that you know aggregates from the town hall going forward. And in theory, if you want going forward, you can connect the school. Uh, and and also and then two from the studio frontier studio uh, community television studio in, in the Deerfield Town Hall, the, uh, you know the Deerfield Channel and the Sunderland Channel in effect, and also Waitley's on there. So those three channels continue as license requirements. And in addition, uh, there will be a high definition channel within 24 months. At the time that high definition channel will be for Conway, for Conway's channel. And at that point, uh, uh, when that channel is provided, Comcast can uh, take back the standard definition channel and provide the high definition channel. Most people have cable ready televisions at, at this time. Uh, if, if, if less than 10% of the public in Conway supposedly doesn't, but uh, at this point, uh, Comcast provides a free of cost piece of equipment so that they can people can view the high definition channel. So Conway's Mention channel is currently channel 15, and that's the one that Ron broadcasts all of the uh, uh, bulletin boards on. And, and, and Comcast seems almost aggressively wanting to change that to a high definition channel. And so we're gonna, we're, that channel's gonna get moved to come out of the server. Ron can send his bulletin board stuff and, and that'll get programmed by, by FCAT down there on their server. And, uh, but it'll become high def. So, you know, all of our, all these meetings are all gonna be, we'll be in high def then, but it'll be probably over, a, it'll be a channel number over a thousand and we don't know what it's gonna be. It's not gonna stay at 15 and be high def. So. That means people can zoom in on you. Yeah, with the owl, right? <laughs> right. The yeah, yeah, that's right. Owl. right. Well, and, and, and zoom and, in on everybody's <laughs> facial blemishes. This is gonna be, you know, I mean, in this room we have hearings and that's when it's gonna be important. Yeah. You, you know, and, Anyway, yeah, right. As, uh, uh, as uh, Bob says, 
that when you put documents um, on 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 in your computers and therefore on the screen, uh, or even if you potentially just film them on on a on a, on a board or on a, a monitor, that the public will be able to see them and read them. So you can follow from home, as Bob says, in the in the you know post COVID world of hybrid cable casting, very important that people be able to see and read uh, what's 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 on the uh, what's on the screen. You know, years ago, not that many years ago, when you were discussing going to high definition, which is very new in the Commonwealth for PEG, I should say you, you're one of the first communities to get high definition in Western Massachusetts. Not the first, but one of the very first. Um, and years ago, we, people thought that public access because of the, the visual nature of it and the outdoors and would be the channel that folks wanted, the PEG channel that folks wanted to have in high definition but because of the importance of documents and uh, similar need to, to read things, most, most towns now uh, with one high definition channel choose that to be the government channel. Uh, the uh, provision that says the, uh, uh, the uh, we talk about demarcation, uh, let me get also here. The quality of the PEG channel, uh, technical quality has to be the same as for the commercial channels, uh, that's up. That's an important provision that can be enforced if, 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 if that were not the case. Um, cable casting, we discussed how with, now within 180 days, Comcast has to complete the connection to the Deerfield Town Hall. The, um, as I said before, there's a DMR, there's a, uh, some, some equipment maintained by the town, but the warranties for the new equipment from Comcast, or other equipment maintained by Comcast. Uh, the, the very detailed delineation of the demarcation points. We had a gentleman, Greg Hall, who was worked with the town 10 and 20 years ago uh, you know, with me. And he was instrumental uh, in, in, in working together with, with Bob, who's extremely knowledgeable, uh, and myself to uh, put together where these demarcation points are, you know, the work done uh, on behalf of the town and by Bob and the committee here actually exceeded the work done by Comcast, partly because the changes they had in terms of figuring out where these points of transfer are located and how to describe it. The, um, we also make it clear that, that since from the very beginning, it was both implicit and explicit that the, the fiber connections that get the signal from your town office to uh, the, the Comcast head end and then to the Deerfield Town Hall and from the Deerfield Town Hall uh, back to the Comcast head end in Deerfield, that, that there's no marginal cost for that to Comcast. And so there can't be any charge for that, nor can uh, there would be anything counted against your franchise fee uh, toward your 5% cap because there is no cost for that. And so we describe that in, in ways here that would consistent with what both parties could agree to, uh, making clear that, that that is already there and that's not something that can detract from the benefits of this license for the town. Ron, I think this was the language you were just referring to, or are they... There's certain certain ways Bill wanted to describe this that they did not want to get into our contract, and and uh, and did we indeed get that? And in that, I, and, and I think did. Bill, yeah, yeah. I think we're we're the only community in the Commonwealth I know that even addresses this issue. It's uh it's a very detailed issue, but yes, uh, the parties agreed. Uh, down here it says there's no charge, for instance, to the town frontier school district, the access provider or access users for PEG or video or ca cable casting origination. And in the section above an E, it says that um, as a result of underlying factors specific to the subject transmission of PEG access programming as set out herein, the factor being there's no additional cost to Comcast. We just didn't say what it was. We just listed specific factors that are, that are present here in Conway that um, that the licensee shall not charge the issuing authority or more impounded or otherwise count against 
any cost or that that or they, they, they that uh, transmission shall not count against the franchise fee, which is the key point that it it under the FCC's in kind consideration order, uh, it's there's no cost there that would in any way detract from the 4.8 percent of gross revenues that are to be paid by Comcast to the town. So yes, we have the Comcast specific good. language there. We just didn't specifically say there's no marginal cost, but we indicated that there can't be any set off. Uh, is, Com of is Comcast that. trying to charge other towns that? Comcast insists they have no intention of charging us, you know, and deducting these fees. And yet the language they insisted on having in here implied they could. But, and are they doing it, doing that anywhere? They're not doing it now, no. But yeah, they're we not, wanted they're the language not. trying to forestall that, I understand. But Bill, this is still sort of a, oh, I don't know, esoteric area for most, for your average resident to be able to look at a bill and determine whether or not this clause, if they know about it somehow, is being honored by- Well, you see, they won't really have to look. The resident won't see anything. It's whether we would see it. That it, <laughs> what it would result in is when, uh, and we're not quite at 5%, but let's say they wanted to they wanted to count certain costs. They can't under the law. They can't count peg capital costs towards your five percent. But let's say they wanted to say, well, there's cost resulting from this transmission to Deerfield Town Hall, or there's cost resulting from the provision of cabled service to public buildings. Uh, they would uh, under the FCC's order where the FCC lost. The narrow issue, but the important issue of what could be charged, the FCC wanted to say they could, the company could charge market rate to the town, and, and again, not charge it, but have it count toward your five percent. It would be uh, the, the, the court said that, that no, you, yeah, you only look at the the cost to to the cable company of providing that service. So the only place this would come up is if and when there was a payment to the town. That that it that that payment and the paperwork would show, or you could you can calculate that. Well, why aren't we getting 4.8 percent? What we're getting less than that, so that the public wouldn't need to be aware of this. The town just needs to be aware, and I'll work with you that uh, when those payments come in, to make sure you get your full 4.8. And you know that's not going to be too complicated because for the gross revenue is shown on quarterly submissions by Comcast and 4.8 is applied to that. If there's any deduction for anything else, the question is why? Because at least pursuant to these exclusions, there should be no deduction for this additional transmission to the Deerfield studio and from the Deerfield studio back to the, uh, the Comcast head in Deerfield. So uh, we'll be able to see this and no resident subscriber has to be aware of, of of this, but I will say that this is something that's not normally dealt with. It's because of the work of the camp committee working together. My work on this, that uh, from the very beginning, we made it clear that this process wasn't going to work if you intend to impact the benefit the town get gets from the license because you're providing some additional transmission on fiber lines you already have there. So that was the understanding explicitly and implicitly, and we made sure that the language addressed that. I like that. That's a good story. It's a good yeah. Conway story. <laughs> We're a unique case. We are unique. That is for sure. It is. No, it's very, very much. That's, that's why it took a while to negotiate this. And I, I should say, at the end, uh, the town could have been luckier. A very uh, a, a, a vigorous, a very uh, uh, talented negotiator, uh, Eileen Leahy for for a Comcast, but a product of Western Mass and Holyoke uh, represented uh, Comcast throughout the negotiation and uh, you know, understood our concerns. We all went back and forth. We uh, technical issues that had to be addressed because of changes that were made in their system and their personnel as mentioned. And she's uh, a, 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 a great advocate for the company. Uh, but at the end of the day, the parties were able to work this out. And I certainly she's want to thank the emergency management contact as well. I mean, this, she does like, they wear a lot of Comcast government affairs reps wear a lot of hats and yeah. do an exceptional job. They're really of the community. You can't say that for any large other other large telecommunication company in America. Comcast 
as a local cable company that, that you know, prides itself on localism, uh, really does know the players, the equipment, the locations. That makes a big difference. Uh, as they say, if you ask Google or Facebook or someone else to come out here, they wouldn't. And so uh, the, it, the law incentivizes both sides to figure out what's important and to talk about it. And from that, relationships build that really do serve both parties well. Uh, access and Conway are important, obviously, for Comcast. And Comcast is an important part of, of the community and telecommunications in Conway and in Western Mass. But we have a good argument, too, that, that it's the Comcast interest for us to maintain people with their cable subscription. Uh, uh, that, I mean, if they want to, if they want to look at Ron's bulletin board, they have to get channel 15. And, uh, and they, you know, the, and, and Comcast believes this, you, you know, that, that, that they know that people are dropping their cable and they're just going with internet only. And we, we want to make sure that that, that people have a reason to hold on to cable, you know, their cable subscription. And the reason it's important to FCAT is that that's the only money FCAT gets, only the cable subscription money, not the internet only money, not any of the other money, just the, just the cable money. And so it is in Comcast interest that we maintain a good, uh, you know, a good set of channels that people want to watch. Exactly. And, and in fact, you get channels from the neighboring communities. Line extension policy, continue to have the uh, provision that was in the uh, last cable license and the one before that, which is an excellent uh, provision for Western Mass, that the, there's a density requirement, but but by Western Massachusetts standards, where there's less density, it's an excellent standard. There have to be 15 homes per mile for so aerial plant. Formula. Yeah. <laughs> 15 for underground, where... Comcast doesn't have to provide the conduit. Those numbers not are those are the same. 15 and 15 for aerial and underground, where there's no conduit required by Comcast. Uh, you know, oftentimes you don't see the same the same numbers, much less 15 homes per mile and 25 homes per mile if Comcast has to provide the conduit. Those are good density numbers as they go. And there's also a formula so that if the numbers are less than that, there's a proportional sharing of those costs between residents and Comcast so that uh, it, it can, we continue to have one of the better, uh, if not, the, I've seen none better in Western Mass. And there are places in Eastern Mass, of course, that have no density requirement. You might have that in a large community in Western Mass, but in places that are suburban, they see much higher density requirements and they certainly have, you don't see uh, lower in, in areas that are as rural as Conway. So, so um, we've built out our, our lines to almost 100%, virtually 100%. But this is going to be good for new new homes that get built. When somebody adds a home, hopefully they're reasonably close to some other home. And, and if they're not, they may have to pay you know more to, to have Comcast build out to them. But not me, they will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they will. Yeah. Right. And you know, if, if you get to a next license and uh, and there's places that are not served, didn't meet the requirement, that's the time to say, well, we, we, we would like and expect the cable operator to build out a little more. I think it's a, uh, every 10 years, it's an issue that needs to be looked at, but as Bob said, because of the work of the town, together with the MBI, you, uh, you had significant build out between the, the last license and this license. Standard installation is 200 feet, uh, aerial or underground, a lot of places, the standard installation where you have one cost, $50, $60, and that's it. Uh, a lot of uh, licenses only provide for aerial standard installation. Conway's provides for both aerial and underground. And the, and the distance of 200 feet is, uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a good distance uh, to have. Uh, sometimes you see as low as 125, 150, once in a while longer. 200 foot feet is a solid distance and importantly, uh, it covers underground, you know, in those places that may going forward, folks might decide to have underground uh, installation. Cable drops to public buildings. This was uh, something I appreciate the work of Eileen Leahy. Uh, most licenses, because of the FCC in-kind consideration order, no longer have like language about cable drops to public buildings, which really doesn't make any sense not to have language. 
if you're below the 5% threshold, because the FCC order would only would allow the company to put that toward the franchise fee or say to the town, you can pay for it or give it up. But, but since the, the town decided to go with a 4.8%, we have some cap room so that when Comcast provides, as it does now, cable service to public buildings, including schools, and if they there's a marginal cost for that, it doesn't take us over the 5% cap. So as a result of that, the committee felt strongly, uh, I felt strongly that this provision should be in the license. It's typically not anymore in the Comcast license, but we made that position known. I thank Eileen and, and, and Comcast for understanding you know, how strongly we felt on it and that license room, that language remains in your license. Subject to the, the fact that, you know, the order, of, if the order were to, if the numbers were such that the order applied, it applies, but at 4.8%, uh, this provision would not put you over 5%. And so therefore that service would continue without any set off for your franchise fee. That's it folks. I mean, any questions I'd be happy to answer. And so, you know, this was a, uh, probably a five year process. It's hard to remember how, how, how long back we went, but you know, uh, we continue to uh, work on the issues together. I, I certainly recommend the board vote in favor of this license. I think it's a very strong license. The, the committee you know, led by Bob, but with the full committee members felt that if there's a way to connect the town of Conway, including a town hall now to the Deerfield studio, it'll make a far better cable access program for Conway residents and also for Deerfield, Sunderland and Wakely residents. And they kept their eye on the ball and we ended up with a license that does that in an effective way. All right, all right. So the, I guess the only question I got now, we've agreed to, to these changes and all of this. How Comcast has agreed to that too? This yes. Is what they came back with. Yeah. Yeah. So we're yes. all good to go. Yeah. I mean, other than like spelling capacity, capa town. That, that's yeah, I understand. understand. But, 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 but the broad bottom line is everybody agrees. All of these changes are in what we got yes. from Comcast. Let's yes. do it. Yeah. I, would, I would have been willing to authorize litigation against them. The drop of a hat. <laughs> and I leave they are not my favorites. No, but no. Um, but good, good. I'm glad to glad glad it worked out, and I think you did a nice job, everybody. Really, thank, thank you. you, thank you. So so, so, so we, we we you know we wanted the the cable advisory committee to approve this, and then you to hopefully take their that recommendation, and we could all vote it together if you want, but. Um, yeah. You know, normally the select board leans heavily on the work of local committees, and I, I really, it's something I really like about Conway, uh, is, is, is the select board's respect of the work of committees that, that do a lot of the work. So your committee already voted to? No, we have not. No, so no, that's why about to do that. this is a joint, a joint meeting okay. of, uh, of the advisory committee and the select board. So Jonathan counts as a yes, right? Uh, I, I don't know, can we do that? I think we can't, but we have we have a quorum. We have a quorum. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but, so, and that may be why he felt okay to leave. I don't know, but I was pleased he was on for a while. But after some time after seven, he did leave. So, so I want to. So, so Bill wrote up this a motion for the select board, which is more formal than I think we need to do. But I would like to make a motion that our cable advisory committee, you know, accepts the the uh, the franchise agreement that we've negotiated between Conway and uh, Comcast. I'll second that. Yep. So all in favor. Aye. 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 So that's good. So. All right. And we'll take that recommendation and, as a select board. And so then Bill wrote up this more formal, you, you know, legal thing. Very good. And Comcast will respect this. All right. You know, and they and and they have they pay great deference to select boards. You know they. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's just the only thing that we can do is make them come here and embarrass them in the newspaper. But yeah, we've, yeah, got, we've yeah. gotten good at that. basically. <laughs> we've gotten good at that. So, Bill, do you want to read this? Um, you can read it, Bob, or I mean, oh. I can put it up. You want me to put it up? Well, I well, printed one of, us has to make, one, one of us on the select board has to make it. Okay, right? so I printed it out. So, as I hereby move that the select board is cable television licensing issuing authority 
Uh, vote as follows to grant the subject cable television renewal license with an effective date of April 1st. So we're not dawdling on this, April 1st, 2022, to Comcast of Massachusetts, to Inc. Comcast. Uh, all terms and conditions contained in the renewal license have been agreed to by Comcast. Comcast by and through its authorized representative shall execute the renewal license, the agreement, as set out on the signature page of the renewal license. And so I printed out, and now there's one more piece, but I printed out two copies of the license for us, for the select board to sign. So the board further votes to authorize the chair of the cable committee with the assistance of, sought by the chair of special counsel for this license renewal to make any non-material changes like the spelling change. So the license renewal agreement document as may be needed for administrative or document related purposes prior to the execution of the license by Comcast. I'll second that motion. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Good, aye. It's unanimous. Thank you, Bill. Congratulations. Thank you, Bill. Thank, Thank you, Bill. You. you got it across the finish line. Well yeah, done. we did. No, we did. It was a, a team effort, really. There were a lot of decisions to make. And, you know, Bob, uh, no one ever had a better partner than, than Bob. We, we at all times of the day and night and weekends. And the committee was always there uh, to go back to and use as a sounding board. And uh, they were fantastic. So, so thank you. My privilege to do it again. I appreciate the opportunity. At eight o'clock at night at our house. When my telephone rings, my kids would all go, oh, it's Bill Solomon. I know it. <laughs> I, 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 I've seen Bob working on each of his daughter's houses uh, and <laughs> apartments on floors and ceilings. So uh, there's 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 not a, uh, a tour I haven't had. Uh, and Bob took a break from his his work as a dad to uh, to work on this. So I appreciate it. Thank we you. Won't, we won't we won't see you again for 10 more years then. Well, you know, I, I live pretty close. I, I go to Pekarski's all the time. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and Gordon's uh, maple uh, syrup is coming up. So, um, and then I will work with Bob and I'm happy as brought, just as a courtesy when those those uh, franchise fee revenue reports come in quarterly, yeah. it, it, you guys can just send it to me. I'll take a look at it just to make sure everything looks uh, copacetic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Hopefully. Now, Bob, I have a question for you, I guess. Yeah. Uh, on the FCAD end of it, who is it going to be our contact person now, seeing how Chris has passed? Uh, well, FCAD has hired a new permanent director, Okay, Jonathan Boshin, if you, if you know who Jonathan is. He's come to some of our meetings. Good guy. He's, he is the guy that when we knew Chris was going to not be able to work for a while. He and Chris spent a lot of time getting him up to speed on how to how to do the paperwork and do the payroll and run FCAT. So so Jonathan is the guy. Well, I, yep. I know that some of their people came up a while back, and when we were discussing some of the changeover of that, or you know, some of the operation of the fifteen. Yeah, and they they had some plan that was going to be a, a wing ding. And we're not going to do that. Yeah, well, sorry, I'm not going to either. <laughs> no, no, no. This is this is this is all that's not. Where in, Com Comcast is going to do this, and that's why I'm really pleased that the, we ended up with Comcast is going to purchase and buy all the equipment hmm. and well, set yeah, it up and install it, it and test it and make sure it works. I, yeah, I guess the only thing I'm really concerned about at this point is the operation of that after all of this stuff gets installed. Yeah. So we'll be doing the bulletin board a little differently, but it's Jonathan you'll be sending stuff down to. And oh, somebody will. Or somebody will. So, yes, from God. I see. So it's not Chris you want to talk about. It's Ron you want well, to No, both. Okay. I mean, I'm concerned that the thing is yeah, going, to, yeah. going to progress in an orderly fashion that's going to be to the liking of the townspeople. And I've been doing it for 30 years. I think yes, it's about yeah. time somebody else did it. I, I yeah, you cannot argue exactly. Pass the baton. Yes. Okay. So, somebody taking minutes or anything? You guys all know who I am, for instance. Um, <laughs> Since I just voted on this, that's a good Louise. good point. Oh, we don't yeah, have Louise, Louise is on. I mean, so she's Louise. Okay. So Louise, we, we have Bill Arduzer and Ron Hawks. 
Well, that means that means that you're there's other you're you're open for other additional volunteer opportunities with town service since you're done with this now. <laughs> Well, uh, um, I, I was, we weren't really done the last time. I mean, wow, oh, oh. Both, both Bill and Ron did. The I was here for the last one. Yeah. Too. yeah. Mm. Oh, the town has needs. We're going to be around for the, the, yeah. the next one, Ron. But w within Vineyard. five years, I may be around, but I'm not going to be working on it. <laughs> within about five years, Whiteley, Deerfield, and Sunderland are going to be renegotiating their franchise agreement. Uh, and and I suspect they will have Bill do that one, too. So I, I'm okay. sure he'll get on it. Uh, Bob, I just wanted to say that if I could, did, that, that, uh, that uh, Chris Collins, uh, you know, the, at the beginning of the process and throughout, coming up with the capital plan, working on that. Uh, helping on the very complicated video return issue and his realities and what's needed. Uh, none of this would have been possible without Chris, who uh, was not at every meeting, but every meeting he was at, he made a huge difference. And that included the meetings with Comcast, who had their engineers, as well as Eileen, had tremendous respect for Chris. And that one of the reasons the process worked so well is because of who he was and what he and others made uh, made FCAT uh, uh, into. So I wanted to, you know, in Chris memory, thank Chris for everything he did very sincerely. We couldn't have done it without him. And yep. I'm, I'm sure you'll miss him greatly. And I, I wanted to let people know he, he made a big difference. We had some board of directors meetings of FCAT right before Chris, Chris was gonna go in and have a major heart surgery. And he was in the hospital down in Springfield, and we were wanted to talk about things like extending the life insurance, the health insurance for his wife, and extending his pay for a little while, and the things that we didn't want him to be worrying about while he was recovering from the operation. And and the last, and Chris attended the meeting from his hospital bed, holding his phone, doing on the Zoom meeting. And uh, that was Chris. It was just so Chris to do that. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank, thank you, Bill. Bill. Thanks. Thank you. Very good. Is that it? That's yeah, it. that's it. That's thank that's you very much. Thank you. Well done. You guys are going to miss Bill's stories, though. You know, he's. He always has lots of stories to tell. And then we have these meetings with Count Get. Analogy, you know, well, it's like this. So, yeah, there's two pages. I didn't notice this. You're in for the K, right? Yeah. So that's that's one of the page. And let me find the same page on another one. Bill asked me to print out two copies. I'm not sure. I'll find out who should have these copies, you so, or Bill or whatever. Uh, send this notification and I'll win Comcast. <laughs> and, and one of the signatures is for Comcast. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you. So I don't I don't sign these until Jan does. Jan, okay. There's two, two, two of these needs. Only one has a place for her. She no. signs one. The paywall. And there's no place for her to sign on this one. And Mike's not in. So. Yeah, and that's what I said. It, so. All right. so here's one. One. Thank you. All right. I see. Uh, oh wait, no, no. I screwed um, these up. Um. So we we do have you want the, the mail thing. That, that was that would have had to go under twenty forty eight hour or whatever because I they just came in. We just put them on the sheet on the chat. Yeah. We can certainly just write my report into the minutes. I read it. It's fine. Right, Is this so the first that we've heard of this? The issue with the bill? I figured there was a history there, but. So these are just for you to put. So this is the capital stuff for next to put it yep. in, rather than me taking it home, throwing it out, you printing it out, and. With that, we can... I have no concerns for announcements. No, I'm good. Uh, I have an announcement actually before we oh. hang it up. But um, 
that, that, that this coming Saturday, uh, Deerfield is having a climate change symposium. They told me today not many people from Conway have signed up for it. So is I it just want to. It, it, uh, no, it's it's in Frontier. It, I don't think it's virtual. It's so. not the first time they've done it. The people that, have, that I talked to that went two years ago, whatever, and the last time they did it, they it was very well thought of. Yeah, so. right. It got, it got good. It got good reviews. It is posted on the website. It's posted on the website, but the guy who is running the, all the speakers, uh, I'm speaking, so that's one reason I'm pitching it, but, but uh, he, he, he let me know today when I talked to him that not many people from Conway have signed up. So I just, people should know it's Saturday, starts at nine o'clock, nine to three, that frontier. And if you want, you can get lunch catered by Deerfield Academy. They're going to have a bunch of electric cars there on display. So here's one more signature page. Sorry about this. I'm not sure they might have gotten them mixed up. I don't know if the council has announced that, but April 18th, I um, am going to be traveling and I will not, I will be on a plane. I will not be able to attend the April 18th meeting. Well, it'll be a while till I'm on a plane, Erica. I'll tell you. <laughs> New Mexico? Oregon? No, Toronto. Toronto. That's good. Either one. Next Monday, yeah. next Monday, April 1st is our next meeting at 6 p.m. Same Fourth. that time, same. Yes. That channel. <laughs> yes, yes. Yep, I got that. So I'll be that. I'll be that one. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Uh, Aye. Unanimous. We stand adjourned.